Welcome to a review of the Adventuria Adventure Card Game. Big thanks to Ulysses Spiel for sending us a pile of Adventuria content to check out. So the Adventuria Adventure Card Game was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Zack. This particular core set features artwork from Nadine Sackel. This is the core box for Adventuria. This is the first thing you'll need to pick up, the one box you need to use all of the adventures, expansions, and other Adventuria content out there. So this is the, the start of the your introduction to Adventuria. Now, Adventuria overall is a non-collectible card game set in the world of the Dark Eye, or Das Schwarz Og, Germany's most popular role-playing game rule set and setting. Now, the core set, this particular box includes four characters, which you can use to play the game in one of two modes, either dual mode or adventure mode. In dual mode, each player picks a character and then battles against the other characters with the goal being to reduce their life points to zero. Now in adventure mode, the players work together to play through a cooperative fantasy adventure. Now, this box includes a full advancement system allowing players to improve their characters over time. And there's also a system for deck building and customizing the included character decks. Now, duels can be played with two to four players. Single duel taking 15 minutes per player, roughly. That's kind of an estimate, depending on how long you take to thinking. Now, adventures can be played actually solo or up to four players. Now, uh, these tend to take about 45 minutes per act to an hour per act. Now, note, there's a three-part adventure in this box set. You can technically play that with six players. It gives you all the cards you need to play with six players, but you're going to need some additional heroes because the box only comes with four. Now, this box set has a manufactured suggested retail price of $34.49 US dollars. Now, to see exactly what you get in this card game starter set, check out our Aventuria Adventure Card Game unboxing on YouTube. Now, I would say I was pretty happy with most of what you get in this box. Uh, rules are split into two books, clear directions on where to start. I dig the dice. You get four D20s and four D6, and each of these features a, the dark eye symbol, the symbol for Dashwazog, on the result you want the most, which is the one on the D20s and the sixes on the D6s. Card quality is excellent, but I will note the cards do feature black borders, and years of playing Magic the Gathering has taught me that can rub off over time. So this is a game there you're you're going to be shuffling quite a lot and handling your cards a lot, and you may want to sleeve those cards. Now, what I was most disappointed with with this box is that there is no actual way to store, sort, or protect the cards or any other counters or anything else that comes in this box. It just has that traditional trough-style cardboard insert where you've got, you know, the trench in the middle of your box. I think anyone picking up this game is going to try to need to find some form of card storage solution. Now, along with this, I will also note there is a ton of air in this box. Well, I understand that game box sizes are based on things like shelf presence and sticking out and being able to feature artwork. Just this box is way bigger than it needed to be. Yeah, unfortunately, from what we've I've been able to, to determine, they do sell and work with a lot of third parties on storage systems and therefore don't actually make their own yeah. storage system with that you can you can buy as as one of their expansions or kits yeah i couldn't find any good way to store this and it's not like just buy a bunch of magic card boxes because there are other components it's not just cards so right now what i have personally done is i have some stuff from quiver time uh, previous sponsor of the show great stuff that i've at least sorted some of the cards into now it's not in my quiver but it's just in the some deck boxes that i have of those which works but I, you know as soon as i open the first expansion i'm gonna have to find something else i can do all right well so there's two modes of play included how about we start with how to fight a duel in aventuria all right, so start, pick a character. There are four characters. You're going to grab all that stuff for that character. Uh, you're going to grab a hero card, a skill card, health tracking cards, th a deck of 30 action cards. There are, again, four different decks, a uh, hero token, a D20, and I would recommend grabbing 2D6, though the game only comes with four. So if you're playing with more than two people, you take one die and you can re-roll or pass them around. You're going to put your hero card on your table in front of you. Uh, the skill card, you can do what you want with. You don't actually use it in duels. I usually leave it face up on the table, but you don't need it. You're going to draw that action card deck, shuffle it, and draw five cards. There is an option to take a mulligan, letting you draw five more cards. You then randomly select a starting player by taking those hero tokens, mixing them up, and drawing one. 
That player then gets the starting player token and everyone else gets a fate token. So really, it's not all of that dissimilar to most fantasy dueling card games we might name in setup. The big difference being that character card, uh, which is is different than what you might get in a magic uh, yeah. game. Which I, I don't play enough magic anymore, but I think it might be similar to having like commander or whatever. You have a planeswalker in play that gives you abilities. So there are several phases to each round of an Aventuria duel, but none of them are really overly complicated. Uh, the first few phases you can actually do simultaneously, which is a nice touch. Everyone's going to draw two cards and then select up to two cards from their hand, which is now larger, to turn into Endurance. These cards are placed face down on the table. Now, in general, these cards are effectively unavailable for the rest of the game. And I say in general because this is a card bias game, and of course there are exceptions. So choose wisely when you're deciding what to turn into endurance. Next, you're going to ready any uh, exhausted cards or untapped your tapped cards. Sorry, Woods of the Coast. Uh, they can protect that term all they want, and we can't publish a game with that word in it, but they can't stop everyone who talks about turning their cards when who uses their magical word. Yes, we have exhaust and ready here in this one. Uh, my favorite still is actually crank. No other games seem to use crank, but it's just what you physically do with the cards. I always like that one, but I'm probably going to use tap for the rest of this just because it's what I'm most used for. Next, starting with first player, person's got that token. Take any number of actions done in any order until you've got none left you want to do. Now, the actions include playing an action card. So something is in your hand. You're going to have to pay the endurance cost on it by tapping your endurance. Action cards include all kinds of things like weapons, armor, skills, talents, etc. Now, most of these are permanents. They stay in play and then can be used every round. There are also a number of one-shot cards and free actions that are played then discarded. Now, free actions can actually even be played on your opponent's turn. Now, most of the action cards are going to have new actions on them. These usually have an endurance cost and are exhausted after use, so you can only use them once per round. These are going to let you do things in the game, like draw more cards, heal yourself, or attack. So... Is there a timing sequence with cards and actions? Yeah, like so. If if uh, if you're in a duel, uh, if I have mm -hmm. an instant and you have an instant, how do we know which happens first? Is there a? There are no specific timing rules on your turn. You can play your actions in any order. All of the free actions are based; the reactions based on something. So timing is obvious, like like you wouldn't be able to play the card unless there was a reaction. And I didn't see any cards that like a counter spells that would counter a counter spell. Maybe that's later in the game, but there were no detailed rules in the book for that. It basically stated that the one shot cards will tell you when you can use them. And yeah. in all games I played thus far, it was obvious. It was after taking damage, play this card to prevent or after doing this, play this or after that roll, re-roll that. Right. Now, one special type of action, of course, is the attack. Every character starts with a basic attack. That's on that hero card that's always going to be available because that card starts in play. Now, several action cards like weapons and spells will also include attacks. Now, there are three types of attacks at Adventuria, melee, ranged, and magic. And in each round, you can only do one of each. Even if you have multiple weapons of a type up, you only get to pick one to attack with. Now, making an attack means rolling a d20 and trying to get under your skill rank for the type of attack. And every hero has different ranks for all three types of attacks. If you succeed... On the check, by rolling your number or lower, you roll damage. Your opponent then gets a chance to dodge. Every character has a dodge roll. They try to roll under the dodge. If they'd make it, they reduce the damage by half. Finally, if the targets manage to get any armor cards into play, they can further reduce the damage by the card's PRO or protection rating. That does exhaust that piece of armor, though. So if you're getting hit multiple times, you're going to need multiple pieces of armor. And of course, there are limitations. You only have one helmet, one chest, and all that type of stuff in play. Any damage left is removed from your health, which starts at 40, and is tracked using these health tracker cards in a way anyone who's played Euchre will be familiar with. So with 40 health, I would have expected the games to run a little longer than your average Magic games, though, as we experience today, what I notice is there's this ramping factor. Mm -hmm. So things kind of speed up as you accelerate. So it's the timing wise, I think it actually runs out pretty similar to a 20 point game of Magic uh, because of, of how you, you start with no armor or, or anything. Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, if one person doesn't get armor out and you get your weapons out, they're going to start dropping pretty fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is definitely, that is something that will come up multiple times in this review is that basically it's an engine building game. There is a feeling of escalation in this and, and urgency that grows as you play. 
Now, once a player has completed all their actions, the player to their left takes their actions. At keep going around the table till everyone's gone. Once you've gone, you do some little end of round cleanup. Starting player passes the start player token to the left, and a new round begins. Once there's one player left standing, they win the duel. Well, easy enough. So now along with this basic flow are some interesting special rules that are definitely going to set this apart from other dueling card games. For one, this is based on a fantasy role-playing game and there is a critical hit system or a crit system. I shouldn't say hit system because it's on both. If you roll a one on the D20, again, low rolls are good. You get to draw a card from your deck. If you roll a 20 on the D20, that means you have to discard a random card from your hand. Thing you do not want to happen. The other thing is there is a fate point system. At the start of the game, you're going to put a number of fate tokens in play equal to the number of players times two. Whenever you miss an attack roll, you get to collect one of these from the center of the table. Or if there aren't any from the center of the table, you can steal one from an opponent. At any time, you can spend one of these to do a few things. First, re-roll a die. Second, give you an additional endurance for that round, which goes away at the end of the round, or draw one card from your deck. Yeah, this is unconventional for a card game, but certainly very familiar to any role players out there. Uh, and it's it's really interesting because one thing I found is because you're not playing your whole hand every time and you're holding on to those cards, mm -hmm. but only five, you're generally going to ha only have a couple of cards in your hands, especially in those earlier rounds. And so if you have to discard, you are guaranteed to mm -hmm. discard something you have plans for. Yes, yes, that is definitely an aspect. Uh, note you can re-roll using a fate point if you do critical fail, and that is often a very valid use for one of those fate tokens. Now, while Adventuria Adventure Card Game does come with four preset hero decks, there is a system for building custom decks. So every character's skill card, uh, which is the card that you don't generally need while you're dueling, but if you try to build your deck ahead of time, has a list of card types they're allowed to have in their deck with uh, like uh, three different ratings of weapons, three different types of armor, items, talent, skills, and so on. In addition, a number of the cards can only be used by certain characters. So they're cards specific to that character. You obviously can take those if you're that character, but you can't take them if you're another. Now, working within those two limitations, you're free to build your deck with any of the cards that come in the game. Now, the deck must contain exactly 30 cards, and at most are allowed two copies of each card. Now, one issue with this character building system is there aren't really any spare cards here. You get four 30-card decks, 120 cards. To modify one hero's deck, you're going to have to cannibalize another. Now, the Arsenal of Heroes expansion is specifically made for players who don't want to do this. It contains copies of all of the non-unique hero cards from the core game, two of each, as well as some that were originally con promos. So as long as you're buying your own box, uh, core box, or only playing with, say, two players, you can do some deck building. But mm -hmm. with a group of four or even really three, you're pretty much stuck with those base stock yeah. decks. All right. Well, we know how to duel now. How about you lead us on an adventure next? All right, playing a cooperative adventure in Adventuria uses a lot of the same rules as fighting a competitive duel, with the main difference being a lot more story elements, the use of hero skills, and, well, the fact you're working with the other players instead of attacking them. You start by picking an adventure. Now, this box has two short adventures and one long three-act adventure. And that three-act adventure can actually be played as three separate standalone adventures if you wish. To do this, you're going to pick an adventure. You're going to open the book to the right page. You're going to grab all the adventure cards for that adventure and have them ready. Players are then going to pick which character they want to play and gather all the stuff for the character, as well as doing any deck building before you get going. Now, as part of that deck building, your first adventure, you won't be able to do this, but you will be able to select three previously won reward cards to put into your deck. Now, you've mentioned that these are 30 card decks. Yeah. Do you have to take something out to add any of those three cards in? Yes, you do. So you are always limited to 30 cards as well as fulfilling those card limits on the back of your skill card. So if you happen to get free weapons as um, rewards and your deck can only hold two weapons, you're only going to be able to use two of those cards and you're probably going to have to pull out some weapons that were already in there as an example. Now, I will note, having played through all these adventures, none of the decks were full at any of their things. So like my deck said I could have five items. Well, I only had four. So your first of each reward type looks like you could probably toss it in pretty easily and remove any card from your deck. But once you get up to your second and third, you're probably going to have to remove cards of that type. 
Now, each adventure starts off with a narrative phase, and this is played by having a player read the story to everyone else. Eventually in the story, you'll get to a point where you're called to make a check. These come in all kinds of reasons, story-based reasons, like spotting an ambush, being prepared for what's to come, praying to idols, basically all the interesting situations that come up in any fantasy adventure. Now, a check is made the same way you do an attack roll. You roll a d20. You try to get a number equal to or lower than the appropriate skill. Um, I don't count the exact number of skills, but there's like 12 to 15 of them, including things like body control, perception, craft, knowledge, stealth, and so on. Now, each character has a score in these, and it is worth noting that every character is unique. Each character has a, a one skill at a 14 and so on, and one skill at an 8. You're going to make your roll, then you're going to look up the results. In the adventure, uh, they did a nice job color coding these so they really stick out to see what happens. And there are four degrees of success here. You either critically fail, you fail, you succeed, or critically succeed. Now, the results are going to be based on the story, and they're very much dependent on the adventure. Most of them usually end up impacting the combat that's going to happen later. And trust me, combat's inevitable. So you might get some fate tokens. You might draw cards at the beginning. You might gain or lose some health. You might grab these tracking counters to track who knows what, which you don't know until you get there. You may get the play cards from that adventure deck and so on. So, and again, note, lower is better. This is a yeah. big adjustment for people rolling D20s. Uh, and most <laughs> of your, your tabletop RPG players uh, who are in North America not used to rolling low. Yes, totally agree. It is a change to get used to. So after you've done your check, the story continues. Uh, depending on the adventure, there might be one or more checks. There could be three more checks. There could be six. Your story is going to go on, but eventually it is going to lead to a combat. Now, I don't know if this is true of every adventure for Adventuria, but it is true of for every adventure in this box. Everything ends with a combat. Now, at the start of every combat, you're going to place a number of cards out on the table. These are those, those adventure cards. And the game comes with a serviceable play map for doing this and keeping things organized. Though I do say serviceable because they made it as generic as possible with plenty of room for all kinds of cards. But like we found it worked better for some adventures than others. Sometimes we had to put cards duplicated in spots and it, it could be better, but then it would be overcrowded for other adventures. And it's not exactly a mat, more of mm. a fold out map almost. Hardcore players would almost certainly upgrade this to a neoprene mat pretty quickly, I would suspect. Yeah. Now, those cards that you're putting out are include these adventure cards, which include things like hero actions. So a hero action card is a card that's in play that gives you a new option. When you're, when you're in combat, you're going to put out leaders that you need to face. There's always a time tracker, which you get to set at one of four difficulty levels. You also might need additional card decks. Like in the base game, there is an event deck, a leader action deck, and one we still haven't gotten to see the demon action deck that are all used for various adventures. Next, you're going to create the henchman deck. This is unique to this game and I thought was really neat. What you're going to do is look through all the henchmen you own. Like at this point, you only have the base box set, but if you open the 20 boxes, you're going to grab all your henchmen and look for a keyword that's set by the adventure. So these include things like orc, goblin, but also include like pirate or servant or undead. You're then going to make a deck out of that and seed the board with a number of henchmen based on the threat level. And now just to note, this is something that sort of tripped me up as I was reading about it and hearing about it. These are the opponent's Henchmen. Yes. These aren't you're you're not building a hen you're building the henchman from the cards you own for your a opponent, the, the game to play yes. against you. Yeah, sorry, this isn't the Dungeons and Dragons. I heard a bunch of people go into the dungeon with me or uh, uh you know, torchbearers. These are these are orc guards and uh, what was the one we kept the, the there was a buccaneer, there was the one orc that was just terrible where it buffed the ones next to it and so on. Yeah, there was yeah, the shaman. Yeah. So once you have all this set up, you start combat. Now, combat is very similar to dueling, and this is why the game recommends you duel first. So at the start, it's the same. You're going to draw two cards and pick two cards to put down for, up to two cards to put down for endurance. You're going to play action cards. You're going to pay for them with endurance. You're going to take actions on those cards, including attacking. Now, note, some cards do work differently in adventure or dual mode, and that's just indicating the card, and it's pretty clear. Now, making an attack works the same, except you're, of course, attacking leaders and henchmen, not the other players. Now, henchmen don't have a dodge value. But most of the leaders do. And one of the things we forgot the most often is rolling the leader's dodge. But that was our, you know, the first couple of games we played extreme. Remembering the leader has a dodge is something you need to get into your head because every leader we saw had one. Um, 
what henchmen do have and enemies do have is a set armor rating that just reduces the damage done. So they don't equip cards or anything like that. Now, when an opponent's defeated, it's just put in a discard pile and you do earn a fate point for dealing the final blow. And uh, so for mechanically, for getting fate points, uh, if you miss a roll, you get one. If you kill someone, you get one. Is that it? Is that the only, the, the only so two? So technically, it's, it's if you miss an attack or attack. a skill check. If you just fail on a attribute check, which does happen, you can't re-roll those. And you don't, you can't re-roll them, nor can you get fate. The important thing to note there is that is for um, dodge. Dodge is an attribute check. And I think that's the only reason the rule is there right. is so that you don't get a fate every time you miss dodge. <laughs> like, but that is the clarification. And in, a, in, in an adventure, the other ways you can get fate is there are cards that give you fate. Okay. And there can be, uh, we have seen it, so the hero actions for that particular adventure can earn you a fate. Okay. But the basic rules are miss an attack roll, miss a skill check, or defeat an opponent. And then modified by cards and everything else, just like every one of these card games. Now, along with the actions on your cards, there is those things I mentioned earlier, hero actions. These, This is a card that's on the table that's going to allow you to make a skill check during combat to do something cool. Uh, these are always thematically fun things. We've seen things like swinging from chandeliers, hiding in a crowd, uh, singing with a kobold, trying to solve puzzles, and so on. Now, fate points do work slightly different in a cooperative game. Fate can still be spent to re-roll a failed attack, but they can also be used to re-roll a failed skill roll. Again, a skill roll, not an attribute check. Also, you can use your fate points for other players. But when using for other players, you can only use them to re-roll. So you can't use them for the things like draw an additional card or get endurance. You only do that for yourself, not your allies. So uh, what about the bad guys? When do they get to do stuff back at you? So after all the heroes have gone and everyone's done, they passed or whatever, the opponent's now at. So each opponent takes action, starting with the leader and then moving on to the henchmen. And it's important you go left to right because the order of the henchmen come out and the, where they are can matter. Uh, you got to see that in the game we played where we had a card that buffed the cards next to it. Now, most opponents get a single action, but some will get more than one. And the ones that get more than one, it's often based on the number of people playing. So if you're playing a two-player adventure, your first boss fight, the leader might get two attacks or might get four, double the number of players. Interestingly, and this is one of my favorite parts of this game, actually, is to see what the bad guys do. You roll a d20 and then read the card. There's going to be a range of different effects some of which are attacks, but not all of them. With an opponent attack, there's no additional die roll to attack. They just do it. They do their thing. No, you do get to dodge. But the leaders and henchmen often have interesting and diverse things, like drawing more cards, like drawing something from the leader card deck, or drawing an event, or new henchmen's coming into play, or your henchmen's may run away, or they may heal everyone on the table. And I really dig this aspect of the game. Yeah, and it's fantastic that it's random what they do. You don't have to worry about if you hit them, they're always going to swing back or whatever. Uh, and the fact that there are blank actions, there are, you know, yeah. the, the the pirate sung, she, sung she, sea shanties at us at one point. Yes, yes. Uh, just they didn't do anything. They were just singing sea shanties. Yeah, I've, I've been insulted. I've gotten the evil eye and many other ways to basically say they miss or they don't attack. I thought it was really cool. Now, once all the opponents have acted, you go to that time tracker card I mentioned before and remove a time counter and see if anything interesting happens. Because what will happen is the time card itself will list a number of timed effects. And it'll just say like a number. It'll say five, this happens, and three, this happens, and one, this happens. What you do have to watch for, this doesn't happen in your first scenario, but later scenarios, is other places these times can show up. So leader cards might have them and some of the henchmen might have them on them as well so it's just a be aware of when the time counts down look at all the cards in play to make sure nothing interesting is happening so far i have not seen anything in any hero decks that are impacted by the time now as expected these do all kinds of things just like everything else in this game they cause some effect to the heroes they change the hero's actions who knows all kinds of things uh, the most common is obviously more henchmen join the fight we saw that one quite often now, at the end of the round, start player token is past the left and a new round begins. Combat continues until either victory or defeat happens. And that sounds vague because it is, because it's different depending on every scenario. These are very adventure specific and often don't involve just killing all the opponents on the table. 
it's nice that even if you do have to have combat, which I admit gives makes sense given the fact that this is a dueling card game, you don't always just have to kill everything. In yeah. fact, in, in some cases, you're really hoping for that certain die roll so people just run away. Yes. On a defeat, it's game over. Game over, man. You discard any reward cards you earned. You get no XP and the game ends. You're welcome to try the same adventure again. You're welcome to pick a new hero or do whatever else you want to do. Now, when you win a combat, you will get a reward that will be listed in the adventure. This usually involves drawing random reward cards distributed among the group. Every adventure I played with rewards says one reward per each player, but I'm sure there are others. Doing this, you actually draw randomly from a deck, which is kind of cool. If you are playing in a multi-act adventure, you get to actually just toss that card in your deck. So that does break that deck building, but it's because it's the stuff you picked up during that adventure. It's only at the end of the adventure where you have to decide if you're going to modify your deck. Another common thing is experience points. This is a really simple XP system compared to um, D&D style XP. Now, if the combat you just completed is part of a multi-pack part adventure, you go through a process they call brief respite between acts. What's going to happen is you're going to get to bump your health back up to 30 if you're below it, and then you get this whole system with respite points, which I'm not going to get into details here. I get into way more detail on the blog, but you get to spend these points for getting additional healing, um, getting a practice card in play, training between battles, praying at the church, or just being more prepared. Now, one thing I didn't run into today, are you able to get more than 40 hit points? No, 40 hit points is your max at all times. As far as I know, the bad guys, though, I know at least one card that gave them three hit, three hit points each above their max. So again, to my knowledge, no, but this is a card game with exceptions. So there may be, I have not tried all four heroes now. I have seen three of the four heroes in place. So there might be the, the last hero may somehow find a way to do that. All right, so now you've completed your adventure, you've completed your combat and it ends up it's the end. Like you're completed the adventure. So that you either completed a single act short adventure like we played earlier today, or the last act of a longer adventure. Now you're gonna spend any of your earned experience points. Each point allows you to either write down one of the reward cards you earned during the adventure on your character sheet to keep it permanently, or increase one of your skills by one. Each skill can be increased this way up to four times. Now, after finishing the adventure successfully or not, you can now pick another adventure to play, but now there's a limitation. Now that you've beaten it at this level and gotten a reward, you can no longer play that same adventure at that same level or lower. You next time you play it, you are forced to play it at a higher level or just play with a default character without any bonuses or grab another hero and play it again. I will say having played the same scenario multiple times now, it's fun. Like there, there there's no real disadvantage to playing it again. Uh, there's either some spoilers, but like there's not there's no decisions there. Spoiled. There's no like you solved the mystery that's going to ruin it. Now, while this does give you a feel of ongoing adventure, like it, you do get some character advancement here and some form of campaign play, there's no actual limit or rules to what adventures you can take part in or what order you do them in. There's also no restriction on what characters can take part, except for that difficulty limit, that if you've beaten an adventure at a certain difficulty, you can't play it again at that difficulty. You don't need the same heroes or the same players or the same group or anything like that to play Adventuria. You can drop in and out wherever you want, and you can even swap characters between adventures, just not between acts. So it's very flexible, but at the cost of being not quite as legacy as we know you tend mm -hmm. to love, but still much better than, say, Cthulhu Death May Die. Totally agree. All right. So now that we've got an overview on how to play, what are your final thoughts on this Aventuria adventure card game? All right, so I got lots to say here. So this is going to be a nice quick summary. So back <laughs> in January, right, Ulysses Spiel reached out to me and offered to send me some no-strings-attached Adventuria content. That's how it was worded. I had no idea what I was getting until this massive box showed up that I didn't even know what it was. I Like, this is a, you know, you ordered from Costco box. And as viewers of our live show got to see, when I opened this rather large package, I received from Ulysses, they sent pretty much every single English translated Adventuria product, including a number of boxes that still aren't actually released in North America and had only recently been translated. And to say I was overwhelmed is a huge understatement. Like, this was, like, shocking, jaw-dropping. 
like we were looking at more than 20 game boxes here and I didn't even know how to approach this. Like, what do I do with this? And for one, there's nothing like the Aventuria adventure card. It doesn't say core set or core box or start here or anywhere on it. So I ended up actually writing my contact and go, what do I do? And he's like, all right, find the box that says Aventuria adventure card game at uh, the box we're talking about tonight. Start there. <laughs> It was amusing, uh, almost clown car esque yes. in unpacking the uh, unpackaging the episode uh, at the end of the episode. Boxes just kept coming out of this this packing crate. I think by the end it was about a five foot high stack, and I'm not exaggerating. So. What I decided to do is start with that, right? So I grabbed that box. The other thing I grabbed that was a recommendation is a small box expansion called the Taylor, the Master Taylor's Poltergeist, which is a demo kit. Uh, more details about that next week. This is a, a small box that contains simplified hero decks for all the four here, all, all the four heroes, and a really short adventure that's great for learning the game. It's literally one check than a combat. This is a fantastic place to start if you can do it. But I'll give you more details on that next week. Now, once I sat down and read the rules, actually Sean read them ahead of time and said this doesn't sound so bad. Um, I was still kind of scared, especially because we only looked at the one book at that point. This is by far the easiest of any adventure card game I've ever played. It is the easiest to learn and the quickest to get to the table. Like during our first session, Deanna and I sat down, fought out a single duel and played the short adventure again, both from master Taylor's poltergeist. And, and that was 40 minutes total, maybe including like rule references and looking stuff up. This was more than enough to teach us the basis of the system and got us ready for playing the full game. Again, if you can get a copy of that demo kit, which I haven't figured out quite how to do that yet, it is worth doing. Uh, I have seen copies of it, uh, at least uh, on stores, whether or not they're available and uh, or uh, in, but they they there are stores out there that that do stock right. the poltergeist. Good because so. it was a backer reward during their latest Kickstarter. It didn't say it was a Kickstarter exclusive, but it was a backer reward on their latest Kickstarter. Right. So this is quite a bit different than, for instance, the Lord of the Rings adventure game, where there were any number of tutorials to slowly work you up to being able to play the massively complex integrated aspects of the full game. Yeah. Like, I can't help but compare this to the Pathfinder Adventure card game for a very similar feel with the stories and the checks and everything like that. And I've mentioned many times just how thick and dense that rule book is and how it reads more like a, re uh, uh, what do you call it? I can't think of the word, a technical manual than it does a game set of rules. Whereas this felt like, here's a game, sit down and play, do this, try this and do it. Bang, done. So I gotta say that I, I, this was so much more approachable. So then we went on to play the game using full decks, the, the ones in the box set, and the game got even better. Like, it was good. Even that demo was like, if I played this demo at Origins, because that's what it's designed for, right? Or I played it at a local con, I'd be sold. I'd be like, all right, I want to know more. And this was even better. Uh, we both ended up actually enjoying the dual system and found it honestly to be up there with many other dueling card games. I'm not going to name specifics, but it's up there. Like, uh, Sean got to try it today. It is a solid two-player well, it could be up to more. We only tried two player. You can play three and four player, but it is a solid dueling card game. The highlight of this, though, that I think sets it apart from other dueling card games, and you may love it or hate it for this, is the management of endurance. That is such a, a painful, in a good way, experience. Uh, the trying to decide what cards to convert to endurance when to do when to convert to endurance and how much and when do you have enough that you don't want to burn any more cards and oh so many times where i'm like no i don't need endurance only to draw a new hand of cards and be like oh i totally should put that as endurance i love the decision making process just that the start of every round just fills you with this oh what do i do yeah, and unlike Magic, where you're used to those dedicated cards giving you mana, you're giving up useful things, right? You have mm -hmm. a 30-card deck, and in, ideally, you've built that deck out of things you want in your deck. Yep. So you have to give up things you want. And while you might get lucky and find a card that lets you swap something out, that's They're... rare, uh, I had one in the, in the deck I was playing, uh, but I never even got to use it really. Um, so one of the things that's really important I find in this game and, and I, I, I suffered from not having today is deck knowledge, right? Yeah. Knowing the composition of your deck 
so -hmm. that you are best able to make those decisions as to whether or not you might or might not want something or if it's too early and you're never going to get that down to the table. So just burn it as endurance right off. And that is also where fight a few duels before you try an adventure to get to know your deck. Like I know Sean, Sean's played enough games with me. We could have dove right into adventure, but I wanted to start with a duel just for each of them to get to see most of the cards in this deck. Now, the other thing that I thought felt very different than many of the other card games is that most of the cards in your deck are permanents that you pay for them. And then they go and play and they stay there. And most of them cost maybe one endurance to use every round. And like they might cost as much as nine to put down. Yes, I there is a deck, a card in the dwarf deck, the dwarf smith deck. It's not the right word, blacksmith. The dwarf blacksmith that has a nine cost card. But once it's down, it only costs one to play. And while there are some cards that make you discard or redraw cards that are in play, uh, Sean got to experience that one during our duel. Uh, for the most part, you play a card and it's there forever, which just felt different from most other card games. Now, my one problem with this system is that it doesn't really make a lot of sense as an ongoing story or thematically. At the beginning of every combat, you start fresh. Beginning of every adventure, you got your hero card, your basic attack on it, and that's it. Now, during the fight, you're going to ready some weapons, don some armor, reveal that you have skills and talents, and in general, build this fighting engine out of your cards. And while I understand it's a game, and to make it fun, you need to reset that, it just seems silly that my dwarf forgets his warfare skill every fight, and I can't locate my weapons at the start of every battle. So, as far as I can tell, adventures only happen when you're camped for the night. You yeah. stripped off your armor, polished your weapons, slipped into your sleeping bag, and then they attack. Which would be great if that's how it was written thematically. That would be pretty boring, but it's definitely not. The ongoing story, your characters should be ready for these fights that are about to happen. And then added to that, there's this weird aspect where at the start of every adventure, they tell you when it happened in the background. And this is something I didn't mention at all in my written review, but there is quite a bit of background in here on the Dark Eye and the continent and the gods and all that stuff. And they have a, a date system. And well, every adventure tells you what date it takes part. Well, the four, three adventures in the base box are hundreds of years apart and like how are the same characters taking part in these different adventures like i don't i i have to assume at least thematically it's a fantasy game but like they found a time machine now well not thematic really it, it yes it's always you woke up in the morning you're completely unprepared and you forget all your skills well my dwarf maybe will get blackout drunk every time i don't know but this system works really well mechanically it's something sean hinted at earlier the slow escalation of only getting a little bit of endurance and having to play weak cards and maybe getting out maybe one weapon or getting a couple cards that'll give you rerolls or something shifting over to suddenly having all kinds of endurance be able to play what you want having more actions available because the beginning of the game it's like okay i can do my basic attack and that's it and then eventually ramping up to playing these big cards and having a fully equipped and trained character just feels good it feels really rewarding it has a really great progression so if you were to start off fully kitted out you'd need a much different set of opponent or opponents to deal with the difficulty and balancing that difficulty would be quite difficult from a gameplay game design standpoint yeah i agree like the game just wouldn't work honestly like if you just started with everything in play like why do you have cards go ahead <laughs> and just make a D character or a dark eye character and fight another dark eye character at that point i think now the other thing is i found this system works really well emotionally right every game of adventure including the one we played this morning starts off with this feeling of kind of hopelessness and being overwhelmed. You end up taking a lot of damage in the early rounds due to not having any armor up. And there are so many henchmen in play and they're all getting all these actions when you only got to do one little thing. And there's all these tests you have to make before you can even win the fight with the, with the hero abilities. And then there's, as you're going, you you start to feel better. You're like, okay, all right, I've I've got some endurance now. And, oh, I I actually can do two different attacks around. We might get through these. And things don't seem so hopeless anymore. Though even late in the combat, when you've got some of your best cards in play, victory is not assured in an Aventuria. Well, we've completed every included adventure here on the easy difficulty. And a couple of them, I always look at the normal difficulty, go, would we have won if we were on normal? None of these combats felt easy. And then, like, I've only compared normal and easy. There are two more difficulty levels. And based on threads on Board Game Geek, Nightmare is appropriately named. (laughs) 
And this is just the base box set. Yeah. Three adventures, four characters with multiple difficulties to work through. So given the really reasonable price, this is a very solid amount of content you're getting. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I find each adventure rather replayable, more than I would, would expect. Um, like Sean played one tonight. I'm sure he'd be perfectly willing to try it again with a different character yeah. or with the same character on a higher difficulty level. Now, while duels are interesting and fun, uh, to be honest, more than I thought they would be, the real joy, though, is playing the cooperative adventure mode and the stories involved. The writing here is excellent ignoring some minor translation issues and the stories are evocative and fun. Like each has been very distinct, providing interesting narrative experiences and surprisingly varied combats for what's basically the same system every time. Yeah. It's, I'll be the first to admit that while translation errors are frustrating, German is a language that is not easy to translate to English. Uh, with their ability to compound nouns for building words and concepts with much more flexibility than English mm. has. Now, what you won't find here at all is any role-playing experience, unless you bring it to the table and do some talking as your character or whatever, trash talking. There are no actual decisions to be made during the narrative phase. While you are rolling some checks, you don't get to pick what checks to make. At least in the adventures in this box, you're never presented with like a which way do you take the path or do you go to the castle? None of that's here. Again, just in the base box. Now, while the stories feel very much like a fantasy adventure from the dark eye, they've got that Germanic feel. To me, they feel like Warhammer adventures. You're not actually getting the player agency you would get from a role playing game. And mentioning those translation issues, there are a number of them, but thankfully in every case, we were able to figure out what was supposed to be said. Now, in most cases, it's just missing articles, right? Uh, the, a, and he, but there is one minor layout issue where just something's in the wrong part of a page. The big problem though is act three of the three-part adventure. They obviously copy pasted the combat section from the last act and forgot to replace some of it. There is a list of cards that to be, you put into play that actually all come from act two. Now, again, it was pretty easy to figure out what should have been there based on other sections of the text and what your physical cards have when you're in act three, but it is a pretty big mistake. Yeah, German has a rich set of articles, but it doesn't always use them, uh, which may come into play here. Although, really, there's no excuse. You need to have someone read through and check your work. Yeah, and I'm sure they had someone, but they, they definitely missed them. Now, another aspect I do appreciate, which you mentioned earlier, is the fact there is some form of character advancement, even if it isn't much. Well, yes, I would have liked a more of a continuing story campaign system. I also love the fact I don't need to get the same people together to be able to keep playing the game. Now, it'll be interesting to see if future expansions add more ongoing story or if they stick to this three-act adventure at the longest and then you move on. So... Who is this game really going to go into the buy column for? Who And who is maybe going to give it a pass? All right. So overall, I, I enjoy checking this out. Like I went from honestly being completely intimidated by this massive amount of stuff I got from Ulysses Spiels to the opposite. Right now, I'm like, all right, when we're done the podcast, can we open another box? Like, like <laughs> let's look at what's in this one. I want to see what henchmen come with this one. Well, what's this character do? If you enjoy these adventure card games, right, the, these recreations of RPG-like experiences, these thematic story games, and this is definitely on the thematic side, you, there's a lot to like here in Adventuria. Uh, we found the onboarding to be excellent. And to be honest, the learning curve is very shallow. We often complain about steep learning curves, especially in other collectible card, collectible and non-collectible card games. You didn't have that here. This was pretty simple, especially if you played a F20, a D&D &D style combat ever in your life. The basic mechanics are here. They're rolling to hit and you're rolling damage and they get to roll the dodge. I love the fact that you have two modes to play. The dual mode is up there with other dueling card games. And the cooperative adventure modes is one of the most fun I played. Like this adventure mode is really what I like the most. This this is the highlight to me. I, I to be honest, I don't play magic anymore. I dug sorcerer, but I don't play it a lot. The the cooperative game is is the joy we had here. I love the interesting and engaging stories that felt very different, despite all being the same mechanics. Like they did a great job of making every combat unique. If you dig games that like you let you take part 
and a great story, check Adventuria out. Now, what you're not getting, though, is a role-playing game. Uh, you're a witness here to the great story. This is this is a card game that tells RPG-like stories, but does lack any player agency in regard to that story. You can't do what you want. You can't drive the different path. You can't avoid the adventure. You can't go do side quests. If you're looking for a role-playing game, you're probably going to want to check out the Dark Eye Core Rules, which is what this game is based on, or some other role-playing game. But if you're a fan of those kind of games and you don't have the time or the the... the regular schedule or be able to commit to a game or you don't have anyone who wants to play that gm role adventuria might scratch that rpg story taking part in a fantasy story itch personally i'm loving everything i've seen in this game so far minus a couple of translation issues and i am really excited to play through the adventures we've already beaten at a higher difficulty level i replayed one today at the same difficulty level with a different character and i am looking forward honestly looking forward to diving into all of the expansion content which you'll be able to tune in here to hear about as i get through my pile of adventuria stuff well, that's it for our review of the Aventuria Adventure card game. For an even more detailed look at this non-collectible card game, check out the written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com.